Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, July 15th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, when trucks attack, leftist media outlets react to the devastating attack in Nice, not by blaming radical Islamic terrorists, but by suggesting that the truck was responsible for the carnage. Then, Flashback to 2014, the Islamic State terror chief told his supporters to run over filthy French disbelievers with their cars. Plus, the FBI and the DHS warn of violence and terror at the RNC. Meanwhile, Alex Jones and the InfoWars crew prepare to depart for Cleveland. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, a coup is taking place right now in Turkey. The military has claimed control. Uh, they said all power belongs to them now. President Erdogan is on the brink. Apparently, he is at a secure location that has been undisclosed. He has taken to the TV there, urging people to take to the streets. But what are they supposed to do? Because the streets are filled with tanks. Uh, reportedly some helicopters firing down into the streets, uh, reports of explosions. Parliament is surrounded by tanks. Angry Turks have actually dragged the commander out of a turret and beat him. Um, so are we witnessing the fall of the Islamist government? We don't know, really, because social media access has been restricted there. Uh, we're not getting too many um, updates as people's uh, Twitter accounts and things like that are being sus suspended there in Turkey Apparently, the Obama administration has been caught off guard. Um, so, some people celebrating <laughs> That's what they'd this. That's like us but, to think. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's not clear to me, Leanne, whether or not they've been caught off guard, whether or not this, as we're being told at Fox News, that this is going to be a more constitutional, more secular government. Right. I don't really believe that. We've seen a power center in Turkey, a competition for power, uh, coming to a head for quite some time between Fatala Gulen and President Erdogan. And we're going to tell you what happened this week that makes me think that really what's behind this is Fatala Gulen. And of course, this, these have been the two power centers and everything that goes wrong, uh, you could say Erdogan blames on Fatala Gulen. But I think that uh, it really may be true in this case. Of course, he uh, confirmed, he said that the uh, coup is being uh, done by Fatala Gulen, uh, by the U.S.-based fugitive. And of course, uh, the issue with this is that um, uh, he w he came into the United States as a fugitive from Erdogan several years ago. There were people in the FBI that said they did not want him here. CIA and others uh, wrote letters for him. He stayed at Langley Air Force. Then he established a base in Pennsylvania. There was a lawsuit that was filed earlier this year. Interestingly enough, I reported on that the middle of December. Turkish Imam's U.S. network of schools to be investigated as part of this lawsuit that was coming from uh, the Erdogan government. And within two weeks, we were hacked, and there was an article that was put up in my name. I don't do that many articles for InfoWars.com. There was an article put up in my name. If you take a look at this article, uh, breaking, coup d'etat in Turkey, Erdogan flees to U.S. airbase and says uh, that the uh, uh, Erdogan was overthrown as a result of a coup staged by a group of high-ranking military officers. That was a false article that was put up. They hacked our site. They hacked multiple social media accounts of ours at the time. But I guess maybe I'll, I'll claim that now and say that I predicted it seven and a half months ago. But it's another indication, I think, of, of what's going on. Another indication that perhaps there's Gulenists that are involved in this. And of course, Sabelle Edmonds has talked about the connection between the CIA and Fatali Gulen for a long time. Uh, she pointed out six months ago, she predicted that NATO and CIA were planning a coup against Erdogan. And that apparently uh, may be what is going on now, especially when we look at the fact that they're pushing this as a uh, civil issue. Mm -hmm. But understand that what happened this week, earlier in the week, uh, you had a situation where they were uh, arresting people who were teachers, who were police officers, military. Uh, and this is something that's been going on for quite some time. There's been multiple coups in the past staged by Gulenist against the Erdogan government. There's also been arrests by people who were part of the Gulen network. They have arrested people part of the Erdogan network. They were held for very long periods of time uh, without trial. And uh, that was possible because there are police and judiciary. They're part of the Gulen movement. And uh, this week, it was on the other side. You had Erdogan arresting teachers and officers. And again, remember that if you're going to try to take over a country, you do it through the education system. That's why I try to tell people, when we look at Bill Ayers and the Students for Democrat Society, what they did 50 years ago, they took over 
uh, put out the narrative of uh, white privilege. He stopped blowing up buildings and he went into education. And now what do you see? You see this social justice warriors, white privilege, uh, a race war narrative that they were trying to build uh, for the last 50, 60 years working. That's what's been going on in Turkey with the Fatala Gulen people. We need to understand that in the U.S., the Gulen movement has 1,000 schools worldwide. They have 300 schools in Turkey. We've got 50 schools in Texas, okay? They get a half billion dollars from the U.S. government. But what happened this last week was not only did they arrest these people, but they have been going through with this indictment, and they have an indictment that was going to uh, uh, charge him with, mul if they found him guilty, he'd get multiple life sentences. Now, this article from just a couple of days ago, as they were arresting officers and anything, was saying, yes, they've had a lot of these uh, cases, but now this is... Uh, the chief indictment prepared by these prosecutors. This is the major case, they said, that will pull all of this together. And within two hours, this was written a couple of days ago, they said they were going to put this together in an indictment. Within two hours of that indictment being served, the coup began. Wow. So I think that's really kind of a smoking gun in terms of the uh, timing. Absolutely. And of course, the Turkish justice minister has come out to say that members of the movement who are loyal to Fatal Gulen are actually uh, behind this, those who are in the army, so we really don't know. It's a little too early to celebrate. I know some people are saying this is great. The military says they want to return to democracy. They don't want Sharia law and Islam. They want to return to democracy. Of course, other reports that ISIS is going to be celebrating this, saying how democracy is a failure and well, promising some more chaos. So it's kind of a little... I think it's going to be it's very likely be a civil war. Sources oh. within the European Union say this is not just a couple of colonels that are doing this. This is a major fight between two sides. And I think the two sides are Fatala Gulen and Erdogan. And we're going to see how this works out. Neither of them are good guys. Neither of them are secularists, okay? It's like pick your poison. Both of them want to set up a worldwide caliphate as right. an Islamicist. But they want to each be the one who's going to be in charge of it, just like they each want to be the ones in charge of Turkey. Wow, incredible. Well, earlier when this news was first breaking, Alex Jones and Joe Biggs and, and David Knight as well gave some instant analysis for what's happening there, and we want you to take a look. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com with some breaking news. As you can see right here, Turkey coup underway. Military attempt to seize power from Erdogan as low-flying jets and gunfire heard in Ankara and bridges across Bosphorus and Istanbul closed. So this is an area that's been a hotbed for quite some time. Alex, uh, what do you know about the situation so far? It's too early to tell right now, but generally the military is seen as more pro-Western and, and not completely radical Islamic because uh, Istanbul, uh, of course, was formerly Constantinople or the capital of the Byzantine Empire, what was left of the Roman uh, Holy Empire. And so a lot of them are crypto-Christians, just like in Syria, uh, a lot of the so-called Muslims really are Christians uh, and are actually followers of Christ. So this is one of the less radical countries generally in the Middle East, but it's also the former headquarters of the Ottoman Empire. So it kind of goes back and forth uh, historically. But it's too early to tell. We'll probably know by the nightly news tonight exactly what's going on. But generally, a military coup against Irgun would be against the more radical Islamic elements that Irgun has been allied with uh, and has been sending in to Syria uh, to attack the population there. Now, of course, the Russians have been bombing the thousands of trucks going in uh, with oil stolen out of Syria uh, and Iraq uh, to Irgun's son and others. So there's a lot of different groups. Uh, there's also some of the other internal uh, organizations that David Knight's about to talk about in a moment uh, that may also be involved in this. But when you see the military openly with fighter jets uh, involved with this, generally it leans towards uh, people trying to get rid of air gun because he's been working with the Islamicists and that would overall be a good thing. But we don't know yet. We also have these big Turkish foundations that are involved in education programs and bizarre behavior here that Irgun has been going after. They've been swearing to overthrow uh, uh, Irgun, so that might be it as well. We're only speculating at this point, but clearly a military coup's underway. David Knight, come on over here. We're uh, here in Biggs's office. Uh, that's where we're shooting this special report. Again, we just shoot different reports around the office to give viewers a full spectrum uh, uh, view and transparency of what we do here. David Knight, what's your angle on this? Well, Alex, there's been a lot of competition, of course, uh, for quite some time between Erdogan and Fatala Gulen. Mm -hmm. Both of them have been supported by the CIA and our government to various degrees. Fatala Gulen was run out of his country in that power struggle. He came to America, uh, brought in as a guest by the CIA. A lot of people said, this guy is a terrorist. 
we need to uh, not allow him in the country, and yet there were people within the CIA, high officers in our government, wrote letters to keep him in here. He's now in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've talked in the past about... And he has billions in foundation money. Yes. Uh, they control over $150 billion uh, worldwide, they say the organization does. They have a 1,000 schools throughout the world. We've talked about how the charter schools here in America... Uh, just here in Texas, he's got about uh, uh, 40 uh, Fatala Gulen schools, and uh, he gets about a half a billion dollars of taxpayer money here as charter schools. Now, there's a competition between uh, Fatala Gulen, who is essentially in exile, and Erdogan, who is uh, con currently the president in Turkey. And a few months ago, uh, the Erdogan government hired a lawyer to come after Fatala Gulen for racketeering and corruption and that sort of thing here in America. Now, what's happened in the last couple of days, just back on July 12th, they did a mass arrest of officers, teachers, and others. Uh, this is from the Daily Sabah and other sources, uh, Turkish sources. Um, there was a mass movement against the Fatala Gulen sources. And understand, he's got a lot of people who are in the official bureaucracy, in the police force, in the military. That is, in fact, what uh, Erdogan, the current quasi-dictator, a fake election, has said they're trying to overthrow the government. So yeah. so are you kind of predicting here? I think that sounds pretty accurate, and we don't know yet that this could be their counterstrike yeah. uh, back against the government trying to roll up their network. That's what it appears to be, because there was a massive move by the Erdogan forces against Fatala Gulen within the last several days. They rounded up these officers, teachers, bureaucrats. Uh, they said uh, they brought the uh, main trial. There's been a lot of different trials, but they said the first collective day of an indictment against the Golanist terrorist organization, as they put it in Turkey. Uh, there, this has been the, they said there's been multiple trials, investigations, but this is a major case. They'll pull together all the crimes in which the group stands accused of. Okay. So that was about to start. So all this stuff, that massive roundup of people, massive trial about to start. And now we learned that there is a military coup there. So that's all we know at this, this point. This is happening right now. 23 minutes ago, the Turkish prime minister claimed that a military coup was underway. And the uh, internet and Ankara has been shut out. There's no social media. And now five seconds ago, this just got updated. Turkish military says it has now taken over. And down here, there's a video of uh, soldiers walking up and down the street telling citizens the Turkish military has taken over. Go home. So they've now installed a curfew. Martial law is underway in Turkey. And the question is, who is behind this? YouTube, Google, it's all shut off into Turkey. Showing that internet kill switches are real. They've put them in here. We're seeing more and more censorship, and there's all these Islamists that are always battling with each other over control. It's, it's, it's a conquest economy, not a renaissance uh, boom economy. And now, here in the West, the renaissance economy, we are bringing in the conquest economy, not the innovation economy. And it's like once their subterfuge starts, folks, I mean, the Arabs will tell you. I mean, it's all about backstabbing. It's all about BS. This is very dishonorable, and we just do not need this here, whether it's 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 the, the, the network, uh, the schools, and this guy with $140 billion, or, 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 or whether it's Erdogan. I mean, look, folks, Turkey is the last big country in Europe to fall to the Muslims. We don't need to bring it into the euro. The point is they want conquest. It's not that I'm against the Muslims. I'm not against the rattlesnake. It's just it wants to bite me. And so, no, sorry. You're not open. You're not a free society. No, we're done. You want to convert to free market? Fine, come in. You want to run around and tell us where bags over our head? Ain't happening. I would add to it, Alex, as you mentioned uh, Europe and the Turkey's position in that in the euro. Remember that just before Brexit, we had David Cameron doing question and answer, and he said, UKIP is putting around these posters about Brexit saying uh, these things about how much money we're sending to them and that they want to bring in uh, Turkey into the European Union. And he goes, that isn't going to happen on my watch. He goes, I think they're at least 30 years out from this. And uh, yet he's he said over and over again, he would love to see Turkey come into the European Union. Well, they've already Union. brought it in. They, they, they got the border open, letting yeah. them bring them in and Merkel saying, bring them. Yeah. Back to InfoWars Nightly News. Oh, look at this. What do we got here? Right here you have uh, planes or helicopters shooting from the sky. Wow. wow. Can you show them? Look at that one more time. They'll come from right over here. Take care of them. All right, more on InfoWars Nightly News tonight. Stay with us, ladies and gentlemen. If you're watching this transmission and you're awake, reach out to the other zombies. Let them know there's an attempt to shut down free speech here in America as well. There's a wave of tyranny happening worldwide. It's time to stand up against it and resist it.
Is George Clooney ready for his panic room? Clooney's been a proponent of open borders and unlimited immigration, but now the chickens have come to his home to roost. Clooney's $11 million Italian mansion is in a favorite vacation spot of the rich and famous. Barbara Streisand, Elton John, Bruce Springsteen, Brad and Angelina, Madonna, and other A-list liberals have all enjoyed champagne wishes and caviar dreams here. But now the place is overrun with migrants. As one resident said, a small number of immigrants is not a problem, but there's simply too many of them. They're not poor, hungry refugees. They're big and strong. But Clooney's building a fireproof, bombproof, attack-resistant panic room. The problem is, Clooney's panic room is at one of his other mansions in the UK, so he may have to be ready to bug out in his own private jet. Such are the problems of the 1%. Run away with the rich and famous. For InfoWars.com, I'm David Knight. White people, get ready to write checks and give up your car keys. Black Lives Matter organizer Ashley Shackelford wants reparations from all white people for 400 years of slavery, when only 1.4% of whites owned slaves at the height of slavery. Check out this quote from Shackelford. You pay me, pay me a check, pay me consistently, provide me safe housing, offer me a job with benefits, run me those Beyonce tickets. Wait, what? Is that a mooching mentality of an entitled millennial disguising their intentions as social activism? Not very well, I might add. Furthermore, Shackelford sees all whites as oppressors, so why would you ask for a handout from someone you hate? She don't care. She's a queer, non binary, black, fat femme who gets off on the amount of labels she has. And oh yeah, getting paid for being a fat black bitch. Article by Paul Joseph Watson on Infowars.com. This has been Gabriel Goldiamond. So at this point, we've all heard about the Nice, France terror attack that occurred on July 14th. People were just trying to enjoy their Bastille Day activities, and they ended up being killed by a jihadist who had actually been planning, I'm sure, to carry out this for a long time. And what you may not know is that jihadists actually have a magazine where they've been planning to use trucks as a weapon for quite a while. Back in 2010, this jihadist magazine, Inspire, suggested step-by-step -step directions for a truck attack to aid would-be terrorists. What they've outlined actually turned out to be a very similar situation to what happened in Nice, France. Uh, one of the things that they said, um, I'm reading right from the uh, magazine here, is that they wanted to use a truck as a mowing machine, not to use, not to mow down grass, but actually to mow down the em enemies of Allah. They said you should pick your location and timing carefully. You should go for the most crowded locations. Uh, to achieve maximum carnage, you need to pick up as much speed as you can while still retaining good control of your vehicle in order to maximize your inertia and be able to strike as many people as possible in your first run. The ideal place is a location where there are a high number of people, like we had uh, in Bastille Day yesterday, and the least number of vehicles. They say if you can get to pedestrian-only areas like this man did on the Anglais Promenade in uh, Nice, France, uh, you know, the city centers, that would be fabulous, they say. This, this is the best. This is, you know, where they're going to have swarms of people. It's fabulous, you know, uh, during certain times. If, he's, if you have access to firearms, they say, carry those with you so you'll be able to finish off your work. And as we know, uh, this terrorist did shoot at the police. Um, this is an idea that they want to implement in uh, countries uh, like Israel, the U.S., Britain, Australia, Germany, Denmark, Holland, and even France is listed. So we see here that these people have these plans for a long time, and they're willing to put them into action. Um, I'm sure that these people had these ideas for jihad even long before uh, fall 2010 when they published uh, this article in the Jihadist Inspire magazine, which is available online. Uh, if you want to search for it yourself, you can see the document yourself. So these liberals and corrupt politicians keep saying that we don't need a Second Amendment, that we need to ban guns. But actually banning guns doesn't do anything when these terrorists are willing to take any means necessary to carry out their attacks. Fox News on July 15th actually did a story about what, about this situation, and they talked about Rep. Louis Gohmert. Let's go to that clip. 
The ISIS group just last month issued a propaganda video. And, you know, I, Louis Garmer is saying the Democrats are making this about a fight about guns. For ISIS, they're saying use any weapons at hand, however low tech. They're saying one such video that was online, uh, one, uh, they said, fill your car with gas. Your neighbor is an infidel. So it's, they're not just saying ISIS is, and terrorists are saying don't just use guns. Use any low tech, uh, you know, device you can to inflict, inflict carnage. Reporting for Infowars.com, I'm Ashley Beckford. Forget what the globalists driving us all headlong into a hell pit have to say. We are most certainly at war. Shocking rhetoric? If it's a world war then you have to mobilize NATO. You have to get all the NATO countries to say, we are gonna commit forces, both ground and air, to wipe ISIS off the face of the earth. We're supporting NATO and we should at least get something out of it and getting rid of ISIS and getting rid of this cancer that we're watching all over the world, that certainly would be a good thing. Western civilization is in a war. We should, frankly, test every person from here who's, who is of a Muslim background, and if they believe in Sharia, they should be deported. And if you are a believing Muslim, you believe that no man-made law, which is what they consider the Constitution, no man-made law can be above Sharia law. However, globalists like French President Francois Hollande and U.S. President Barack Obama would have us all behave as sitting ducks just fodder for the revolving door of repackaged horror, blaming the carnage on lone wolf attacks and controlling the narrative right down to the very language we are allowed to use as we all face certain doom. Terrorist, because that's the event. Now notice over here, Muslims are not terrorists. The Holland and the, and Merkel their jizya, their bride price for continuing in power under the new caliphate is to betray their own people, to lie to their about their own people and to their own people. Right. So they've, in fact, they've had the meetings where they the say, situation. you've got to give us cover for our jihad. We want to see you let us do this. Just like a gang member to be initiated has got to go kill an old lady for no reason. This is literally a gang initiation. Well, this is a gang initiation where the leaders of Europe are lying to their own people and they know they're lying Good to their God. own people. This is their bride price, their jizya tax for becoming safe dimmies and keeping their power. Now, some of them might just out and out say, I converted long ago, I'm a Muslim, fooled you. Or they might say, as long as I keep my palace and my villa and my estate, I don't really care. But their bride price, their jizya tax is to sell out their own people. The narrative has to change, or more innocent people will certainly die. Anthony Frieda writes, perhaps instead of lying after every act of jihad and saying that Islam is a religion of peace and that terrorists are perverting Islam, Obama and his cohorts should tell the truth and express the fact that these horrific acts are sanctioned by Islamic dogma. At least 84 dead in Nice, France, after a Tunisian living in France rented a 19-ton refrigerated truck that he used to kill at least 84 people and critically injure 50 more. Ten of those killed were children. All of this on Bastille Day, the French independence holiday. The irony in this attack is probably lost on most people, because most people can't see from the jihadist perspective. The attack in Nice was an expression of the coming caliphate's own independence bad ideology beats no ideology even an evil bad cult beats secular nothingness and nihilism that's right uh you know the the postmodern nihilistic uh uh all things are the same there's no there's no good there's no bad that means islam wins because don't we need a new crusade i mean the crusade's got a dirty name but we were attacked for 400 years before we went in there and kicked their ass and i'm sorry if they want one and, and this time we won't attack countries that are, that are uh, uh, moderate. Saudi Arabia and all these other jihad centers, they want to fight. They need to really get one. Well, the, the, the good thing is that we have this constitution, so we have at least a legal uh, uh, trench line to fight in, which is that our constitution is above Sharia law. And anybody who says, 
for example, Hillary Clinton, she wants to, to pass this thing called UN Resolution 1618, which outlaws blasphemy against Islam, like, like Obama said. You know, the, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet. And that's why the Internet now won't let you criticize Islam, enemy, because that's blasphemy. Gone is our First Amendment. Well, that's Sharia. That's submission to Sharia. And even the true atrocity of the attacks themselves have been scrubbed as not to offend the Muslims, and more importantly, not to push the growing worldwide populist movement over the edge. Paul Joseph Watson writes, There are newly released documents from a parliamentary inquiry into the November 13th ISIS massacre in Paris that claimed the lives of 130 people. The documents discuss reports of how some Bataclan victims had their testicles cut off and stuffed in their mouth, a common atrocity committed by jihadist militants across the Middle East. Other victims were gutted or decapitated, while others had their eyes gouged out as Islamists filmed the gruesome scenes. How much longer can we endure this jihad by immigration, this attack on free speech by the tech world, this collusion of globalist collapse strategy with our own federal government as a one-sided war ramps up on all of us, regardless of your race, political views, or social standing? How much horror can we endure before we finally wrestle the deceptive narrative back to the foxhole of truth? Make no mistake about it. Treason stinks to high heaven, and we are most certainly at war. John Baum for Infowars.com. Every candidate in the history of the world, Democrat, Republican, when they receive huge amounts of money from Wall Street or the drug companies or the fossil fuel industries, what they always say, not going to impact me. <laughs> and our question is, if it's not going to impact their decisions, why would Wall Street be spending $15 million? I don't think that you are qualified if you get $15 million from Wall Street through your super PAC. I don't think you are qualified if you have voted for the disastrous war in Iraq. I have come here to make it as clear as possible as to why I am endorsing Hillary Clinton and I intend to do everything I can to make certain she will be the next president of the United States. And that was Bernie Sanders and just a brief sampling of the times he has spoken out against Mrs. Clinton saying that she's unqualified for the job, she's in bed with the big banks and what does Bernie Sanders do? He backs the candidate who is backed by the big banks. Now, if you do recall, this is the guy who's supposed to be fighting for the rest of us. Bernie isn't a product of uh, politics or privilege or all these other things like these other politicians. No, he's fighting for the little guy, you and me. But it seems now that people are feeling the burn in a completely different way than they did before. And we have this article here by Paul Joseph Watson. These people with Bernie Sanders tattoos must be feeling pretty stupid right about now. <laughs> As you think about Bernie Sanders, the anti-Wall Street candidate, has betrayed his entire support base by endorsing Hillary Clinton, the ultimate Wall Street insider. So all these people who uh, have no regrets, as the guy has on his chest right there. Bernie effing Sanders, of course, the, the little head tattoo of Bernie. And one in particular is the young lady there who is wearing the hoodie. I want to talk about the comments that she made about Bernie Sanders and why she was feeling the burn earlier this year. And we have the article here, while I'll never regret my Bernie Sanders tattoo. The young lady went on to say, he will go down in history for starting an uprising of Americans, promoting us to stand up and saying enough is enough. Billionaires own our country, political systems, and we want to reclaim our democracy. My tattoo is not only a symbolization of my support for Bernie, but it also serves as a reminder to myself for the years to come. He started something big, a revolution in people's thinking that I am so proud to be a part of. Now, once again, uh, you guys may have heard this when you're growing up by your mom. Well, your mom may have told you not to get a tattoo in general. But they said specifically, don't get a tattoo of a, a team or a band or something that your interest could wane in over time. Of course, the team could change their name, move out of state or any number of other things. But 
in a similar way, you have to look at your political candidates like this. And as I talk about Bernie Sanders supporters, when I was 17, 18 years old, I probably would have liked Bernie Sanders too. You know, he's a, in a weird way, he was somewhat of an exciting guy. He captivated many young people, uh, first time voters to go out to the polls and get politically involved. So for that, I can understand that aspect of it. But when you take it to the extreme of getting a tattoo of somebody you don't even know, a politician of all things, who will say pretty much anything to get in office, you have to think about this in a little bit of a different way. And for all the people who got your Bernie Sanders tattoos, or even if you didn't get a Bernie Sanders tattoo, but you were feeling the burn a few months, a few months ago, and now you're feeling like that Pepto-Bismol feeling because he's uh, endorsing Mrs. Clinton. I want you guys to remember this. I want you to remember this feeling right now as you think about Bernie Sanders and how you felt when he got up on stage and endorsed Mrs. Clinton. Because so many people said, Bernie's the only guy. He's not with the banks. He's not in all this other stuff. He is the guy for this country. And now he is backing the Democratic Party's candidate, uh, Mrs. Clinton, just because she is in his party. And this is why I don't personally get into partisan politics. I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. I have libertarian-esque views, but I'm not a pure libertarian because then they say you have to agree with everything on our list. You have to support our candidate no matter what. And I don't do that. I like this policy. I like that policy, but I'm not going to blindly support a party just because I am a, a part of it. And with this, I want to go back to a throwback piece that I shot earlier this year. And this was college kids feel the burn. Now, we went out to the University of Texas and we were talking to the various people out there, asking them who they supported, why they supported them. And the majority of the people we talked to said they like Bernie, you know, for X, Y, Z reasons that I've already mentioned to you here today. And I'm wondering if they still feel as strongly that he's the guy for them. And this is the thing I understand that when I'm talking to the young Bernie Sanders supporters or young people in general, first time voters. Like I said, this, this stuff affected me too. I wanted to believe that everything politicians said were, was true, but now having gone through several election cycles, I understand there's the things that they say to sound good. There's also things that they have an intention to do, but may not be able to follow through on that. For example, let's talk about uh, candidate Obama. A uh, candidate Obama said that he wanted to shut down Guantanamo Bay. Now let's say that he was true and sincere in this statement. You have Guantanamo Bay, a uh, facility filled with uh, heinous criminals. Of course, we've seen the articles of people who don't need to be in there, but I'm just talking about the people who really are a threat. It'd be like if you shut down Arkham Asylum, okay? You, you shut down Arkham Asylum, but you don't want the Joker to run right wild on the street, so you still got to put him somewhere. A similar thing with Guantanamo Bay. What are you going to do if you shut down this facility? You still have to house these people in some other place. And that's what I'm talking about. These campaign promises, all these things that may sound good at the rallies or you uh, see them on the talk shows, you read it in your news reports. It sounds good. It sounds great. But how feasible is this? I did not feasibly see a way Bernie Sanders was going to tackle the big banks. Now, did I want him to tackle the big banks? Yeah. Was I Bernie Sanders supporter? No. But I wanted to believe that this man really had the intention of going after the big banks and busting up the system that has caused so much havoc here in the United States of America. So just keep this in mind. You know, you, you took one, you took one on the chin. Hey, no big deal. You got plenty more election cycles in your life uh, here in the United States of America. So just remember that. And let's go out with this. College kids feel the burn. Hey, how you doing, sir? We're asking people who their favorite presidential candidate is. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Right now? Yes. Probably go with uh, Hillary Clinton or Rubio. Someone Hillary Clinton or Rubio. Rubio. Any particular reasons why? Uh, I want someone more towards the center. Bernie Sanders, for sure, probably. Okay, so you're feeling the burn. Uh, any particular reason? Probably as a student, all of his policies about um, tuition-free college. I don't know if it'll be possible, but it works for me. Who would pay for the free tuition? Hopefully the rich people of America. <laughs> How's he going to pay for all the free stuff that he's oh. suggesting he's going to give? I think, you know, he's going to try to, like, you know, obviously, you know, uh, use tax money to pay for it. Not Donald Trump. Not Donald Trump. <laughs> There's why, my answer. Why not the Donald? Um, I just think he's, like, not um, as involved in politics as he should be in order to be our president. I feel like he's too business-minded. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Any particular reason? Uh, no, I don't really follow politics, really. I just, uh... Just don't like Donald Trump or uh, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> How you doing, Miss? We're asking people who their favorite presidential candidate is. Uh, Hillary. Hillary. Yeah. Any particular reason? 
uh, she's a female and everyone else I just, uh, I don't know. Not that I'm for, I feel out of all the ones that are candidates right now, like she would be the most appropriate, but not ideal. Okay. Is there any particular policy that you like about her? Um, no, I guess just that she's a Democrat. I guess that'd be the only. Well, why not Bernie if she's a Democrat? No, because she's female, so sorry, right. <laughs> but that's why. <laughs> Anything in particular with Bernie? Well, I mean, this uh, this clear issue of the the one percent and the, the ability of the rich to become richer and not necessarily having a better distribution of wealth in the country. I think that is a very good you know conversation to have. Now, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but my understanding of what you're saying here is that you are supporting uh, Bernie Sanders and his wealth redistribution. No, well, yes, I am. Yeah. Why do you like Bernie? He just seems like a good guy. You know, he's a socialist, I believe, and uh, I believe in what he stands for. We had a referendum last year, I don't know if you're aware of it, where um, Scotland had the opportunity to break free from the United Kingdom. Yes. Um, and I was very much in favor of that because we wanted a, social, a socialist government. Let me, let me ask you this. Let's say mm -hmm. 20 years from now, you, you have that UT education, you have your big career and whatever, and you're doing good. Would you be okay paying for somebody else's oh, tuition absolutely. at that point? Absolutely. I think it's for the responsibility of the upper class of America to take care of the lower class. Well, there you have it. The majority of the people we've talked to in the short time we've been here at the University of Texas support the Democrat Socialist Bernie Sanders. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. Well, the terrorist has been named in the Nice, France attack. And imagine my surprise. Once again, his name is Mohammed. Now, I'm quite surprised that we got that information uh, from the media so soon. But you'd really have no idea if you took a look at the New York Times or CNN this morning. You'd think that it was a rogue truck that somehow became animated, plowed into these people. The headline, truck attack on French crowd, scores die. CNN says, truck rams crowd, 84 dead in Nice. So this is just like when there is uh, some sort of a mass shooting. They say gun shoots. It's never putting the blame where it belongs. And as we know, um, suppression of information is key. It's a key tactic used during wartime. And indeed, we are in a war. But that's not all. We can kind of go back a few months. This was actually a story that Paul Joseph Watson broke yesterday. Now, this was hours before this attack took place. So this story uh, kind of got suppressed with all of the news coming out of France. And this is actually a report that the French government covered up torture of the Bataclan victims and this was uh, in order to avoid offending Muslims. Margaret, I know you have some more on that. I do. Good evening, Leanne. So we're talking about the French government's inquiry into what happened in the Bataclan Theater in November and the, the, the shocking, startling reality of what these terrorists did to these people, these Islamic extremists. Um, it's just not coming out. And the shocking part of the story is that the French government tried to censor the media from reporting it. They withheld it from the victims of the, the families, you know, the, the people that actually this happened to, it was perpetuated against. And they withheld this information. Why? Because it's, it's part of the sanitation process, so we don't actually know what's going on. We know that the gruesome torture included cutting off the genitals of uh, victims, women that they couldn't, obviously they couldn't cut off their genitals, genitals, they would stab them repeatedly in the vagina, disembowel them, chop off their heads, torture them graphically. And if the media had just done their job and talked to eyewitness accounts of survivors, they would have known that. But the, the steps that the French government took to ensure that this information never got out, and this inquiry, it's, it's sort of a leakage, if you will. They were trying to keep this in. It's so shocking. This would be the first thing you would report. Right. Well, they don't want people to see the gruesome images when they don't want to offend a certain population. Of course, it was perfectly fine to use that photo of the dead child washed on the beach to push for more immigration, but they don't want you to see the gruesome images of the children who were mowed down in the streets last night in mm -hmm. France. They don't want you to see that. That's too terrible, that's too gruesome, but it's perfectly fine if it's gonna further an agenda. Or men having their genitals cut off and brutally tortured while they were still alive. You know, their bodies were so severely bloated. And the startling aspects of looking into this case, the French government, they blocked the media from reporting the torture of the Bataclan terrorist against the victims. Not only did they do that, but they tried to whitewash it once the information came out. They said, you know what, these bodies, they were, they were blown up, they were so badly, you know, we really aren't sure. We didn't find a knife on the scene, so we can't really confirm that those are knife marks. Well, 
Well, really, uh, what did they do? I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. really? Their genitals right. were removed prior to killing them. I mean, it doesn't get much clearer than that. And I was looking at older media reports. So in the times of the Vietnam War, the, the barbaric nature of that, it was shown graphically by the media. And people were able to decide for themselves exactly what the truth was. In this case, it is a, it is a very hardline effort to deny the truth, to sanitize it, to whitewash it, to further the agenda that the mass immigration policy is withstanding. The French people have been disarmed. And when you see something like that happen and people that are motivated to brutalize and gruesomely maim bodies before murdering people, it's just, it, it's like all hell's broken loose, right. honestly. Right, and that's the thing that people need to see it is gruesome. You don't want to see it. You want to hide your eyes. But this is the reality of what is happening um, in these countries that when they hate the West and they're willing to do anything to take it down. Speaking also of whitewashing of this killer, now they're kind of saying they're they're quoting his family who says he he had nothing to do with Islam. He wasn't religious at all. He never went to the mosque. He drank, did drugs. He beat his wife. So, you know, I guess that means he just maybe beat her a little bit harder mm -hmm. than is allowed because of course, moderate yeah. Muslim believe you can lightly beat your wife. That's perfectly fine. So even here, they're kind of running with this thing. Was he truly Islamic or was the killer just depressed about the breakup of his marriage? Right, because whenever I have a bad breakup, I decide to go plow through mm -hmm. thousands don't of people though, for a mile. Don't you though? Don't we all? Uh, that's exactly the appropriate response. We're, to, of course, talking about Mohamed Boulal, 31 years old, the Tunisian immigrant that assimilated into the French uh, society, French culture, ultimately landed in the French Riviera, incredibly expensive part of France, and he was working as a driver. Been looking at his background all morning long, you know, he killed 84 people. Let's not forget that. And the, and the stories that you were absolutely right, a truck killed these people, anything but the actual Islamic extremist killing these people. And he was said to have committed petty crimes, theft uh, prior to this major incident, but he didn't really show any signs. So um, I, I went looking for a sign, and I know you and I talked about this article before. He traveled to the United States in 2014 to visit a mosque in Brooklyn. Now, this mosque, it actually has a Facebook page, and uh, it's it's got the address of the mosque. It has his Facebook page that's actually liked the mosque. And it, you really don't know if you're living in a radical mosque zone. And then a story like this comes out and you're like, wait a second, this man that plowed into 84 people, killing children, women, infants, brutally was visiting a mosque, not on a do not fly list, N nothing stopping him from coming into the United States and becoming more radicalized. This is coming out of the Daily Caller, and uh, it's really unbelievable. The most shocking part of this, 430,000 likes this facility has on Facebook. Right. I mean, it's just totally shocking, totally. How do we, how do we stop this is what people are wondering. And, you know, we have Newt Gingrich coming out and saying, anyone who is Muslim, we need to just go ahead and ask them, do you agree with Sharia law? We need to... If you do, it's not compatible with Western, uh, with Western society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it, that is sort of an extremist take on this, but we are in a war mm -hmm. at this point. We are at war with an ideology. And obviously there are plenty of Muslims here in America that love this country, mm -hmm. love being a part of That's the West, right. love the fact that they live under the constitution and not Sharia law. Mm -hmm. And we're not... Um, marginalizing anyone here. We're pointing out the fact that there is a radical ideology called Islamic extremism. And they the fact that uh, Speaker Gingrich came out and Hannity, he actually backpedaled. He was like, well, I didn't really mean that. I think we should test them. You know, give a, give a Sharia law test. Okay, uh, that's a new one on me. But he's he's speaking to the sentiment that we have people residing in the country that wholeheartedly abide by Sharia law, that accept the tenets of Sharia law, that do not respect the U.S. Constitution, uh, respect our society, respect any aspect of the freedoms that we have under the Bill of Rights, and Sharia law is their law. Now, what he was saying was we need to test, and uh, he's been really hammered all day to the point where I noticed he was backpedaling just right. a little. Of course. Well, that's you've got to check your privilege. You can't say things that are going to be offensive to a privileged minority of people. And now kind of switching gears here because a lot of people are saying with these recent attacks, um, officials are obviously likely very concerned with what's gonna be happening at the Republican National Convention. You and I are gonna be reporting from the ground mm -hmm. there um, as well as a whole bunch of the crew. Alex Jones as well will be giving a major speech there. 
So we're all kind of worried about the potentiality for some terror there. Now, we know it could be coming from George Soros zombie protesters, mm -hmm. um, people who are going to be really uh, kind of going against Donald Trump, who has called for the disallowing of Muslims to enter this mm -hmm. country. And of course, this with Newt Gingrich, uh, this is probably going to exacerbate those feelings. You know, for and you're absolutely right. We're going to be in Cleveland, Leanne and I both, and the rest of the Infowars staff, including, well, many of the Infowars staff, including Alex himself. It's so exciting. I can't wait to be there. I can't wait to see you guys there. We love you. We love your support. But just touching base back to what you said about the, the possibility of an act of terror. And I just want to say, we, we live in a free society, Leanne, and we practice liberty, and we wholeheartedly believe in love and liberty. And the only way for our liberty to stop is if we start practicing fear. So we're going to be there. We're going to be out in full force. We're going to be covering it. I am so excited. I can't wait. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody there. Yeah, absolutely. We are part of the liberty movement, and that's what we need to keep our eyes on. Eyes on the prize. So that'll be we're reporting. I think we're going to start reporting, actually, Sunday, we'll get some reports coming out of Cleveland there. And then, of course, moving on to the DNC in Philly. Thank you, as always, Margaret. Glad to have you on board. And thank you all for tuning in to the news tonight. I know we've got just some incredible breaking news here on a Friday night uh, going into the weekend. This is how it always ends up. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe button. And you can also become a subscriber to PrisonPlanet.tv sharing your username and password with up to 20 people at the same time. This is key information, and you need to share this with the world. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you here Monday, 7 p.m. Central.